Good evening and welcome to this meeting of the Planning Committee. I am Councillor Pauline Hazel and I will be chairing the meeting. To begin the meeting, there are a few matters of housekeeping. A risk assessment, including COVID-19 risks, has been undertaken for this meeting. Hand sanitizer, wipes and masks are available. Masks must be worn while seated and when moving around the meeting room, unless you have a medical exemption. These can be removed when speaking and addressing the committee. Action in the event of an emergency. There are no practice alarms planned for this evening. So if an alarm sounds, please evacuate the town hall by going down the main staircase or the back staircase to the high street and then to the car park behind the town hall in St. Ronald Street. This meeting is being recorded for live broadcast over the internet on the council's YouTube channel and will be available afterwards. Please would speakers use microphones at all times and speak directly into the microphone and would participants both joining us online and in the moot hall, please mute the microphones when not speaking. Members of the committee will introduce themselves, starting from my right, then the rest of the committee sitting opposite. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Councillor Robert Davidson, Mersey and Pyfleet Ward. Councillor Roger Mannion, Tiptree Ward. Councillor Jackie McLean, Marksdale Low Ward. Councillor Gerard Oxford, Highwoods Ward, substituting for Councillor Beverly Oxford. Councillor Lynn Barton, Shrub End Ward. Councillor Helen Chouas in Enns and St John's Ward. Councillor Martin Warns, Beer Church Ward. Good evening, Chair, and good evening to those listening at home. Councillor Dave Harris, substituting for Councillor Mike Lilly. Um, forgive me, Chair, I will be wearing my mask all the time because I have a wife at home who is waiting for an operation, so I will be playing it safe. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Harris, and our very best wishes to your wife. Democratic Services Officers Richard Clifford, oh sorry, I beg your pardon, in attendance here are Planning Officers James Ryan, John Miles, Daniel Cooper, Simon Cairns and Martin Mason from Essex County Council. Democratic Services Officers Richard Clifford and Robert Carmichael are here for procedural matters. Members of the committee may use electronic devices to access their meeting papers and visitors are welcome to use mobile phones and other devices, including cameras, but please use them discreetly, set them to silent and do not use voice or camera flash functions. We may have a break at eight o'clock subject to the items remaining. There are toilets on every floor in the building and an induction loop in this room. This is a quasi-judicial committee which makes decisions based on material planning considerations following the laws of the land and policies of the council. If the committee is minded to refuse an application, members will use such considerations and evidence that will stand up in a court of law. The material planning considerations are listing, listed in the committee's agenda. You have heard our substitutions, Councillor Gerard Oxford for Councillor B. Oxford and Councillor Harris for Councillor Lilly. There are no ur urgent items this evening. Members, do we have any declarations of interest? No, there are none. Have your say. If anyone has a petition they wish to present to me on any of the items on the agenda this evening, please do so now. Thank you. I will now go through the applications one at a time. Our first application is 7.1, Cone Key land to the east of Hythe Key, Colchester, full planning application for the demolition of existing buildings and construction of student accommodation blocks. It's recommended for approval our presentation officer is James Ryan. We have Rod Isbister speaking against and Simon Talbot speaking for. We have Councillor Mike Lilly speaking on this application. 7.2, land at Briley Paddocks, West Mersey. 
application for vari variation of condition on reserved matters. It's recommended for approval. Our presenting officer is James Ryan. We have no public speaker against, and we have speaking for Harriet Vincent Wilson. Item 7.3, Unsworth House and Joseph's Court Hythe Quay, change of use from offices to student accommodation, recommended for approval. Presenting officer John Miles, we have no speakers for or against and no visiting councillors. Item 7.4, Shrub End Depot, demolition of existing baling shed and construction of new baling shed. Recommended for approval and our presenting officer is Daniel Cooper and again no speakers for or against and no visiting councillors. Members, the last three items, uh, do you wish any of them to be called out or are you happy for these to be considered on block? Chair, I'm happy for them to be considered on block. Thank you very much, Councillor Warns. Um, Mr Carmichael, please would you go through them for us? Thank you, Chair. So the items on block are applications 7.2, which is reference number 212685, land at Briarley, Briar, Briarley Paddocks, West Mersey, which is for approval, as noted. And 7.3, application 213463, Unsworth House and Joseph's Court, Hythe Quay, Colchester. And application 7.4 on the agenda, which is application number 213353, Shrub End Depot, 221 Shrub End Road, Colchester. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. So, members, are we happy to approve these three items on block? All those in favour? Thank you. I can confirm that those items have been determined in line with the officer recommendation in the report and amendment sheet, and there will not be further discussion on these items. Any interested parties in attendance for those items may now wish to leave. Thank you very much. So, we come back to item 7.1, which is the Cone Quay land to the east of Hythe Quay, Colchester. Um, Mr Ryan, would you be kind enough to go through this with us, please? Thank you very much, Chair. Good evening, members. I'll just share my screen. So we are here to have a look <clears throat> at an application for 270 student accommodation units on the site at the Hive um, between the main road and the river. And I will uh, take you through that in a second. It's for studio accommodation, um, surrounded um, cluster kitchens for bespoke student facilities only and associated facilities, landscaping, and importantly, works to the river wall. Bit of a dull picture this, but you might just be able to see the site in there. Long strip of land running down the corner. I've got some better images in a minute. Slightly zoomed in. Apologies for the poor quality. So that's the wider, slightly more zoomed in picture. Got the residential buildings here. Access road to the houses opposite in here. And the river that runs down here. So I'll quickly whiz you through the floor plans. It's quite a large scheme, so it's difficult to see at this scale. But that's the ground floor. Going up through the stories. And you'll see that there's only the larger element at the southern end. That's a roof plan, and that just shows you that there's some green roof and PV on top of some of the flat roofed elements. I've got a better drawing of that 
in a minute. Um, these are some sections I'll whiz through these. So these are the elevations, but I've got some more zoomed in. I think the most important thing about this image is the space between the two. Um, this scheme originally came in with three blocks without much spacing between them. Um, that was originally for 300 units. This has been reduced down to 270. This block, this uh, gap here, sits opposite the Spinnaker pub um, in an attempt to preserve the setting of the heritage asset, which is the Spinnaker pub. And to, uh, although views are not a material planning consideration, the applicants wanted to provide or retain some views for the Spinnaker pub opposite and some of the residents opposite. This is a slightly more blown up plan of the ground floor. You'll see a condition on the um, papers that suggest a slight rejigging of the ground floor because in discussions with um, the highway authority, it was felt better to have the cycle parking at the southern end. You can see it all in there. Currently, that's the northern end of the site. Um, they would like that moved to, I'll quickly take you through the floor plans, but generally their bedrooms and a central cluster of kitchen, lift and staircase in the middle. It's on the northern block, just the roof of the northern block, the southern block. So that, as I was mentioning before, the cycle park is actually gonna be moved to this section here because it was felt more efficient to have cycle parking at the university end so students can pick up their bikes and cycle straight along to the university without needing to use the walkway along here, which I'll talk about in a little bit. So here's the floor plans above ground floor level. This is a kind of green roof and a small amenity area for staff only on this floor. Then this, the top floor will be surrounded by a parapet wall. This is the southern, sorry, this is the northern block end on. The northern block in elevation. You've seen attempts been made to clearly reference the industrial past of this part of the hive. Uh, they've used a kind of grid system to really articulate those elevations. <clears throat> so they're not only articulated by the windows, but they're articulated by the, the grid of projecting and inset brickwork. So it won't appear as a flat surface. It'll break the massing down in terms of it being quite rich and textured in that respect. Similar kind of idea on the other side. This is the larger, taller block. So this is from the rear stepping up. And this is the elevation that will um, face south, um, yeah, south down the river, effectively. And again, you've got windows, you've got um, contrasting brick colors and ridging in the brickwork to kind of break up the massing of that block. <clears throat> That's our block in profile. As you can see, different brick types and articulation with that kind of grid um, brickwork. And because that will be modulated quite nicely, the light and sh as, the, as the sun passes around it, it will cast shadow lines right across it. So it will really break up that massing and won't appear too bulky. <clears throat> Here's some sections we can go back to if anyone needs them. So here's a landscape master plan. Again, it's at quite a large scale because it's a long site, but um, the idea is to, I think I've got a zoomed in image in a moment, but there's um, a great deal of landscaping going in up this end, along the roadside. And particularly interesting is this public square that's being created. Um, there'll be tree planting, landscape planting with planters, and I'll illustrate later, but if you see this little section here where my cursor is, that's called a tidal terrace. Um, where they are rebuilding the seawall right along there. There'll be a gap in it to allow the tide to ebb in and for biodiversity purposes and for the kind of placemaking it will create, it will be a, a um, kind of reed bed area, a little bit of intertidal mud flats that you'll be able to walk over on the um, foot bridge there. So it will add some visual interest and it will be a really nice place that's being created. So the, the um, Architects in conjunction with the landscape architects have really thought about this in, in, in terms of creating a, um, a really interesting space. And that's just some more tree planting diagrams. One thing I will note is the northern end is, needs to be rejigged in planting terms. 
because there's been further discussions with the highway team and the cycle people and they want a because this footbridge which is you'll see in a minute the white footbridge is actually a cycle bridge as well they want a good connection to the new crossing that's going in at the top which i'll show you in a second so here's a uh, example of that slightly blown up version of the tidal terrace at the bottom there and the landscaping area to the north where the bridge currently terminates <coughs> and the southern end of the site there and um, here's a example of the of the wider site in highways terms some better drawings of that zoomed in slightly so this is the north uh, north is to your right south is to the left <coughs> center of the site with the you can see the tidal terrace here and the public realm that's been created and this is the existing footbridge which is a cycle bridge footbridge um, this bit is going to be rejigged in landscaping terms as part of the condition just to improve the connectivity between the um, the landing of the bridge and this new crossing that's going in what's indicated here is a zebra uh, highways have asked for a tiger. A tiger is a zebra with a kind of hatch lines for cyclists. So it's a controlled crossing. And actually, if I go back, there's a uh, non-controlled crossing here. So there'll be one of those kind of drop curb situations where you can cross, but don't have the uh, a uh, zebra in because we don't want two zebra crossings too near each other. Here's a quite important drawing that I've had, um, that I asked to be annotated, which is the, in terms of the heights and the building heights, um, this is a uh, massing drawing of Hyathe Key, which members approved a few years ago and has been now been fully built out. Uh, that's at 29 metres above datum. 3408 above datum is the application site at its highest point, though significantly lower throughout. That's just the kind of landmark um, tower at the end. And 32.35 on this side of the river is the maltings, which I'm sure everybody knows, but I will show some pictures in a minute. <clears throat> so quick tour of the site. This is right up by the Hythe um, Bridge where one crosses to the station. So quite a long way, but that's just about see the maltings in the distance there looking straight down the river with the maltings in the terminating the vista. <clears throat> Here's just an example of the kind of state of the public right of way further up. It's actually completely blocked, so not passable whatsoever. Uh, it does actually run along there, but is not passable. That's the kind of pinch point we're looking at um, further up the end. That's looking back as if one is looking north to the um, old warehouses. This is looking back down the site. So you can see the maltings in the distance there and the white bridge I spoke about. Further down road, just demonstrating where um, the complete lack of footway effectively on this side of the road, which sort of forces you into the carriageway and no, no crossing to make anything simpler either. It's just more demonstration of the public right of way that's been effectively blocked currently. Tire. Little car company that's currently on site. Uh, this is taken from the bridge, looking at the uh, boats that will still will have to be moved in construction, but we'll be able to moor alongside afterwards. So, um, the view to the moorings from and across the site from the White Bridge. Another view looking at the Spinnaker Pub and the flats opposite. Moorings in the distance. You can see the sea wall is sort of uh, in a poor, very poor state of repair along here. And one of the key benefits of this scheme is a significant investment the applicants are making in completely rebuilding the seawall all the way along there to allow um, the rejuvenation of the public right of way along its definitive line and still allow the mooring of boats alongside. Um, just the seawall works, they're, they're out at tender at the moment, but that's around a million, I put about 700,000 in the report, but the current tender estimates are nearer a million just for the seawall works. Hence why the site hasn't come forward before. It's been vacant for just over 50 years, apparently. 
There's the, uh, what was the former Juicen site over the other side of the river and the Maltings in the background. This is what is currently the public right of way, but is effectively a little garden for the um, moored boats, but you do you have to kind of clamber over their fence to get through it. This is the more open part of the site with the large concrete wall uh, that currently demarcates the boundary and the sea wall, which is uh, effectively collapsing. It's the back edge of the uh, about three meter high concrete wall. That concrete wall was um, is all that remains of the site was a effectively a set of coal bunkers, and that was the rear wall of the coal bunker to stop the coal rolling into the road. And that's the uh, that's why that's there. Flats opposite, and the Spinnaker pub you could see there. There's the concrete wall again, and looking back across the site, the maltings that I mentioned again. Flats and Spinnaker. That's the access opposite directly to the National Grid. Uh, gas holder site. That's uh, CBC owned uh, site. Also opposite. Spinnaker pub again in the uh, the wall. The wall. You'll see a condition proposed retaining the retention or the replace. So the um, reinstatement of the public art. That's a picture of one of the items of public art. Some more of it there. It's the road opposite. Kind of the highest convenience store opposite that, looking back towards Maltings, Juice and Site opposite, just a glimpse of Hyde Mills there. That's the Hyde Mills building that I showed you an image of in terms of the massing on the other side of the road. That's the Maltings. Quick CGI's, so they've uh, these kind of demonstrate the um, proposed appearance, I think quite successful in demonstrating what it will look like, more than the plans I showed previously. So that's from the other side of the river, boat moored up and the kind of, you see the architectural language in terms of how that massing is broken up by the um, various inset brickwork panels. New sea wall in place. That's the gap between the two blocks and you see the tidal terrace here. Nice bit of public open space and public realm. It's all, that will all be left open for the public to use. Of course, public right of way currently runs along here, but is impassable, but will be fully rejuvenated. That's the current kind of estimate of what the uh, landing of the current white bridge will be like. It's going to need some rejigging, as I said, to ensure the definitive right of way, its definitive line is maintained and to allow cyclists through to the tiger slash zebra crossing that is proposed. There's a view at night. And a view with the juice and site flats on the other side of the road and uh, other side of the river, sorry, and the proposed scheme here. Just a quick a few shots on the LVIA. It's these are verified views. That's as existing on the top, and that's the building there you can see as proposed. That's the view from the road bridge as existing, and that's as proposed. And that's existing from the other side of the river. Oh, sorry, from the footbridge. And that's as proposed. So I think that's enough. Um, obviously, happy to answer any. Actually, there's a, a few things I do need to say. Sorry, um, a few important points I, I do need to raise. Um, See, so I mentioned the new river wall. That's a really significant public benefit. Um, it will completely rejuvenate that side of the river, which is virtually impossible to realistically walk along without jumping over obstructions or um, diving into the existing piece of reed bed where the land has completely slipped away. Um, that is a really significant public benefit and will open up a really important connection from the existing road bridge um, opposite the Maltings up to the new crossing and the existing um, cycle and footpath um, white bridge. That's a really, really important point. Um, this is a large scheme, there's no doubt about it, but it's going to take a scheme like this to deliver those kind of public benefits when such significant engineering works are required to make the scheme deliverable. Um, 
The scheme has got some really interesting sustainability credentials. As I mentioned before, the, the applicants are really keen on sustainability and biodiversity net gain in particular. They're, gonna, they're in, interested in using as much photovoltaics on the roof as they possibly can. Um, insulation way beyond what they need to in terms of the building regs. Um, there's a very limited car parking on site. It's really there to avoid to allow drop off and collection at student arrival times through a kind of scheduled dropping off period. So there's a little bit of servicing vehicles only, but no actual student parking. Um, however, there is an EV charging point there. So service vehicles on that will be able to charge their cars. Um, in terms of biodiversity net gain, it's something we need to be really mindful of these days. And they are um, working with a CNET who are a company slash charity that are going along the coal and dredging the rubbish out of it effectively it's as you'll see at very low tide unfortunately the coal has got particularly at this end has got um rubbish shopping trolleys all sorts of detritus in the channel and part of the offset to the biodiversity net gain um the um secured to the um legal agreement this will a, don a donation to facilitate further works to rejuvenate the actual coal channel itself has been suggested and that's a great way of we like biodiversity net gain as much as possible to be on site so there's some green roofs on the building and obviously there's significant landscaping going in but to get a really strong figure of 60 percent or thereabouts uh, the applicants are working with that charity to clean up the river directly next to the site so i think that's a you know commendable approach I've mentioned the public right away, but it's really, really vitally important, um, particularly that cycle link, which will allow currently if you cycle across the bridge, you end up kind of being ejected onto the carriageway of the uh, of the main road uh, with no easy way of crossing in a carriageway to head north towards town. So now you will be able to pass through a little bit of the site, you'll be able to cross the bridge, turn right, then turn left across the crossing and join the carriageway that way. So that's a great, another great public benefit and will really demonstrate the connectivity benefits that this scheme brings. Um, there's a couple of points I wanted to raise quickly about conditions. Um, since the report has been published, we're still negotiating on some of the conditions, hence why delegated approval has been asked to, has been requested or for officers to only impose the ones that are absolutely necessary. Um, archaeology has now been fully bottom, bottomed out and we don't need the archaeology condition anymore and the botanical survey has been completed and has been passed to our consultants for review so we'll hopefully be able to not need to be imposed um, and the same is the is true for the contaminated land the applicants are consultants are sure they've done enough for contaminated lands are currently talking to our contaminated land people to hopefully avoid the need for that condition I think I'll leave it there and we'll let the speakers have their say and then any questions I'll be delighted to answer. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Ryan. Chair, apologies for interrupting um, before we... Sorry, apologies, Chair. Um, just to... Um, I didn't want to, want to interrupt Mr. Ryan in this flow when we were going earlier, but we did miss the minutes earlier when we were going through the items. But what I was going to suggest is with your approval, Chair, we'll deal with that at the end of the meeting after we've done with the application. Apologies for not bringing that up. So. Uh, well, thank you for the reminder and apologies for missing. Thank you very much. Um, will Mr. Rod, is Mr. come to address the committee, please? Um, Mr. Is Mr. You have three minutes and a bell will go after two. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Rod Isbister, and I am the current landlord of the Spinnaker on the Hyde Quay. If the part of the council's decision is based on the proposals of support for the application, then I strongly object on the basis of possible manipulation of the support. The first application had well over 90% objections. The second application saw waves of support suddenly and constantly appearing especially after numerous objections. These proposals often have no substance and similar wording. It has come to our attention that overzealous canvassing and offers of incentives 
were offered in return for submitting a proposal. This, we were told, took place at the developer's site in Avon Way and involved students and staff. Surely this is unfair and these people have a conflict of interest. Proposals submitted between the 5th of December and the 17th of December are of particular interest. The Council have all the information from the proposals and ask, I ask for a full transparent audit to be carried out to establish due diligence has been conducted regarding all comments submitted. Further steps can be taken later such as a judicial review. The case of a judge, Keith Shaw in Whit Whitby, November 2017, saw him convicted of fraud offences for submitting numerous applications with consent of other people's details and so subvert a planning process. I leave that with you. Moving on to the development, myself and many, many residents will lose our light. The developers have asked for flexibility. You cannot have flexibility with a 10-storey building. The other side of the river in Hawkins Road is becoming, okay, and in the future, so sorry again, the other side of the river contains, sorry, the other side of the river in Hawkins Road is becoming, and in the future will be the main student hub, and rightly so, let it flourish, it's a perfect area for these vast student blocks. Our side of the river contains many families and community fed up being neglected, a regeneration fund given away to the Visual Arts Centre. So please, please don't exchange it for this oversized monstrosity on a totally inadequate strip of land. Keep the students over the river and let our community flourish. Recent permission given in Hawkins Road for student flats of 263 had 36 parking spaces. That's excellent, brilliant, no problem. This development with 270, I'll say that seriously, 270 has no parking. We all know students, we all know people. Students have cars, that's a fact. The developers' false glossary images and claims of riverside walks and the public domain accessing over 70% of the site, that's absurd. 70% of what? There is very little land left once it's been built. It's exaggerated to the extreme. Half of the riverside path is only 1.8 metres wide and will surely be a huge, huge safety concern with the amount of proposed people on site and the public usage. It's just not wide enough. Please do not put the final nail in the coffin for our community on our side of the river. I thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Mr. Isbister. Uh, may I ask Simon Talbot to address the committee, please? Again, Mr. Talbot, you have three minutes and the bell will go after two. Thank you, Madam Chairman, members and officers. Um, just really would like to paint a little bit of a background to the company for those that don't know us. Um, I last sat here in December 2018 uh, when we were going through the expansion of our current Avon Way scheme. Um, and commended that to you and, uh, uh, and as many of you who've seen the scheme know we delivered that and it was actually first two blocks were in occupation in the September of the following year in 19 and overall that scheme which was completed in 20 put nine million pounds into the local economy predominantly with local subcontractors local building companies uh, and local consultants we are a family company we are a local company three directors three owners one from Sinosis, that's me one from mersey that's james behind me and one from halstead and that's chris our construction director uh, also nine of my staff who work at avon way three of which are sitting behind me here um, i have to address the slanderous comment about paying people for for supporting our application there's no denying we had pictures of the application and we encouraged our students who live at Avon Way who might like to live down there to offer support. We did not pay anyone money to do so. That is absolute slander. Um, no one was paid to write reviews. They were all genuine uh, recommendations and support and they were from all genuine residents of the borough, be they student residents granted. Um, so I refute that uh, at the highest level. Um, moving on to uh, the Colm Key scheme. Uh, we estimate that that will put another five to six jobs um, into the site, uh, into the team, 
and during its construction that will have an overall budget of somewhere in the region of 25 million pounds um, about 18 or 19 of which will again um, using uh, local contractors wherever possible they're the people we know they are our routine contractors we are uh, an operator that develops and builds. We're unusual in that sense, in that we design buildings that we actually want to run, and we think de deliver a great product for our students. We're not someone building this up to go and flog it to the bloke around the corner for a profit. We will own this site for the next 20 years to run it. Um, moving on to the Spinnaker, we have worked really, really hard with local engagement. We put a, an initial scheme in, as, as Mr. Ryan alluded to, um, we had a large consultation period, and from the feedback from that, we tried to deliver what we were asked for, which was open space, bringing back as much parkland and open area as we can there. We've got over 60, 65% open space there. The whole site is accessible to the public. It's highly secure, 100% CCTV coverage linked to the police in all common areas. It's got a category one life preservation system. It's sprinkled throughout. We look after our students. You ask any of our students at Avon Way, do we look after them? Yes, that's why they support our applications because we are a, a bunch of humans that work with people. Um, We've uh, been working, as I think James alluded to, um, with Emily on the council to get the local e-car club going, which I think has just gone out to tender. Nothing to do with this planning application. We're doing that because we want to do it. We want e-car clubs, e-scooters. We are very, very environmentally aware, again, because our children are at university. Our children have to live with this. And this is why I commend this scheme to you. And without a scheme of this scale, this 50th anniversary, I know it's the Queen's Jubilee this year, but this is a golden jubilee of this site sitting empty. And without a scheme of this scale, it will never get developed. And I commend the scheme to you and would ask you to support it. Thank you very much, Mr. Talbot. Do we, do we have Councillor Lily? Is coming through on Zoom? I'm here, Chair. Good evening, Councillor Lily. Would you like to address us? I would indeed. Thank you very much, uh, Chair, and good evening to everybody uh, here. Um, I'm here tonight to speak against this application uh, for Down the Hive. Um, we believe, and my fellow councillors back that up, uh, more councillors, we've had an awful lot of uh, complaints come in with objections to the scheme, um, and we have met with the, the Spinnaker and a lot of the residents down there. The concerns are, 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 should be taken into consideration more, really. This application, uh, no problems with it, to be honest, and I like the green buildings, but this is an application too far now in this area. It's too much. Uh, there's too much student accommodation down there. And it's trying to squeeze these massive buildings into such a small area down there. We would and should like, if you're going to make a difference uh, to the area, and it's full of pollution, cars as such, it should all be landscaped and left and given over to the community to, to use. That's the way forward. Uh, if we, if you think about it, are we really helping our environment about this? We've signed a uh, declaration in the council, climate emergency, and what do we do? Build more buildings. These are massive, massive buildings as well. Uh, there's no color in them to add anything. They overlook all over the place. If you built, if you had a flat across the river uh, and you looked across, all right, the scene wasn't great, but it was open, now it won't be. You can have massive blocks of building that resembles more of East Germany than uh, East Germany ever existed before. I'm afraid that this is an application far, far too reaching for us, overlooking uh, as antisocial behavior problems, parking problems, all around that area is massive. And I feel sorry, really, for the Spinnaker and the other guys down there, uh, such. But the one thing that we must object to in this uh, area is the massive flooding issues. Again, today, there was a massive flood along Haven Road and that area. Uh, built up over the years, nothing has been done, no action has been taken. I sit on the house the Hive Task Force uh, talking group, uh, sorry, action group. And all we've done is talk about who's going to do what, and yet it continues to flood. As the ward councillors, 
we will not support any further applications down the hive until the flood has been sorted out once and for all. Don't add to the problems by giving them permission for this tonight. Just see how you could release the problems and build a better community by having open spaces instead of buildings. Thank you, Chair. I shall leave it there. Thank you very much, Councillor Lilly. Um, James, would you like to comment on what you've heard so far from our, from our speakers? Yes, please. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I'll go through those points in, in order. Um, yes, with regards to the representations that was noted, um, they're all, we only accept representations that have, a, that have an address attached. Um, so they are all on the website. They're all absolutely up in the um, public domain for everyone to see. So that is transparency. Um, they some came from far away. Some came from very very close by. Um, they've all been equally considered, and the um, the decision has been made in the planning balance, as you can see in the uh, in the report. In terms of loss of light, that was mentioned, an impact on amenity and overlooking. I think the report deals with that in some detail. Um, it acknowledges that there will be some impact in terms of impact on, on amenity, and that is an inevitability of developing a site opposite a existing block of flats. Um, the, the sentiment that the land should be given over or um, used as a park, for example, instead of, of a development like this um, is problematic because it is, this is previously developed land, it's brownfield land that is whole, the, the redevelopment of which is very much strongly in line with what the government is looking for at the moment. Um, the benefit of developing a site such as this, as you'll see from the report, is that it um, totals roughly 108 dwellings on our land supply, a scheme of this note. So this effectively indirectly protects the borough from widespread unallocated speculative development in all of the rural areas because this will maintain our five-year land supply by developing a brownfield site. We need to bring these brownfield sites forward. Um, they're really important in terms of their windfall additions to our five-year housing land supply. And when you're doing with uh, as officers at the moment we've got two quite large appeals on um, it comes into sharp focus how important our land supply is um, we have um, a, a strong demand for housing and this counts towards it so i didn't want to underplay that it's really vitally important um, the other public benefits as i mentioned before the biodiversity net gain the reinstatement of the footpath and the, the new sea wall which would simply not come forward without a scheme of this um, scale. As the applicant stated, they've reduced their numbers within the application period and they've done what they can. They really have desperately tried to engage. Um, it, it's a kind of scheme in a position where it is that it's not gonna please everyone. And I think the report acknowledges that. It's not fully supported by all neighbors and there are neighbors there that will clearly feel the impact from the development, there's no doubt about that. And that's why we have the planning balance. We're here to assess whether on balance the scheme is a recommended for approval. And in this instance, it is. It doesn't mean it's absolutely perfect in every way. It doesn't mean it's not gonna have impacts, it's, it will. And I think the report clearly acknowledges that, or I hope it does. Um, but on balance, the public benefit of the scheme is held to outweigh the harm that it does cause. Um, Mr. Ibbstern mentioned the safety of the public right of way. Um, there's at least, there is one, the public right of way um, is, is so old that it, the public right of way team weren't able to provide a defined width of it, but they would work on the basis of it being 1.5 metres wide along the edge. Um, the applicants have left at least 1.8 and more throughout, but in, at pinch points it's 1.8. But as I showed you from those photos earlier, further along the public right of where it's completely blocked, it goes down to almost a metre or less. So that's, that's relatively generous. Taking anything any wider would so significantly limit the developable area of the site. It's simply just not possible, unfortunately. So again, it's the planning balance. It's really important to get the public right of way delivered and the seawall works and the heavy engineering it's going to take to do it. That is um, what's on offer, effectively. 
Um, the point about student accommodation being better off at the Hawkins Road side of the river. Um, as you'll see from the report set out very clearly, there's a significant demand in student accommodation, and that's just going to grow and grow and grow. To provide for that, obviously there's some scope for development on the university site, but that is constrained because it's a listed park and garden, so that can't be filled to the nth degree. So the, we are, as planners, asked to look at these schemes, and this may well not be the last of them in the immediate area, to be perfectly honest. Um, officers feel, in line with members' previous thoughts on other schemes, that this is the right area for student accommodation and maybe is more appropriate than other schemes further into the town centre. And that is one of the reasons that we are supporting this here. Um, it will, regardless of some of the thoughts about students, for example, it will bring people into this side of the river and they may they will inevitably spend money in the shops and community facilities in the area so it has a knock-on effect that is that is held to be beneficial also there's the you know significant economic benefit from the construction phase and the employment of the site to consider which is another thing that helps tip the planning balance um flooding has been mentioned and that is a really important issue uh at the hive i know the Hyth Task Force was, managed, was, was mentioned also. The flooding that is referred to, I believe, is the flooding that happens right near the malting scheme, which I pointed to on a number of occasions. Um, I think at high tide, the outlet valve for, or outlet uh, pipe, or the uh, termination of the outlet pipe that drains distillery pond, ejects at the seawall by the maltings and on a high tide I think it causes pressure effectively and backs up and that's what causes the flooding at that end um, at the, the low point by the hive. This scheme has come with a very detailed flood risk assessment that's been assessed by the Environment Agency and the lead local flood authority, um, that's the county suds team and they're satisfied that this will not cause materially harmful um, off-site flooding due to the general strategy that's been proposed so that would not be a reason for refusal in this instance i think that covers the oh parking um our in-house uh, sustainability and transportation team are very keen on retaining this scheme as car free that is the idea that you just don't offer students parking and then they do not bring their cars it's not an area that's easy to park in off off um off site um there are many other student blocks in the area and um, for example the hive mill scheme found that when they they have a few more parking spaces and when they took their first intake of students students just did not bring cars because they didn't students didn't think they would have the parking um the malting scheme which i pointed at has an undercroft car parking area but has significant vacancy in that parking a space in that parking in terms of parking spaces so the idea with this scheme is that people are not offer parking and they do not bring parking because it is so it's very well located in terms of location for its access to the um cycle network and footpath network to get to the university and therefore you've got all the other facilities in the area shops leisure facilities nearby and therefore a place where you can happily live without needing your car and that is what the uh, beyond the box highly encouraged by not providing a significant amount of on-site provision. So we would much rather this scheme uh, be retained as um, and not further, ultimately further landscaping given over to, to parking that is not wanted on a car-free scheme. Thanks very much. Any Thank further you. questions, happy to answer them. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ryan. I have, uh, I'll open it now to the committee and I have uh, one speaker, Councillor Barton. Thank you, Chair. Um, right, I've just got a few points to raise here. Um, can you confirm that there is actually a defined need for more student accommodation in Colchester? Because I know there's a perception amongst residents that we have an abundance of student accommodation. And over the last few years, we've had quite a few applications that have been approved for student accommodation. Well, surely there must be a limit 
So I just wonder if you've got any evidence that this is in fact really needed. That was the number one. Um, secondly, when I first saw the application, the buildings do seem incredibly tall in that setting because it's quite a long, narrow space and they do seem intimidating and my first thought was that it's overdevelopment of that very small site in my opinion so just wondered you showed us some comparative heights but were those heights all buildings the other side of the river that you showed us in which case if they were have you got any slides that show this development in relation to other buildings that side of the river and if so is this application considerably taller than anything else that side of the river they were two points that I felt were quite important. Um, thirdly, to be honest, it has got a few merits because it would be wonderful to see the Riverside footpath reinstated. I mean, it's been years that it's been inaccessible and I think that's appalling. And also it would be wonderful to have the sea wall repaired because over the years we've had lots of issues with ownership of the wall. No one's taken responsibility and therefore over the years it's deteriorated quite badly so it does need some serious investment so it comes to what you said it then comes to a balance uh, of, of whether it's worth having this development to get those benefits and I'm, I, I'm not convinced at the moment a final point if this application were to be successful is there any chance of incorporating what the cycle group requested in that they want to have the um, bridge widened so that you don't have to have the dismount signs because we all know that that's a big deterrent to cyclists that have to dismount when they're in full flow. So they were my three main points. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Barton. Councillor Davidson. Thank you very much, Chairman. Um, I can't help feeling that this is significant overdevelopment on this limited site. I, I accept that the developer uh, says that he's got to have that scale to make it profitable but actually as councillor barton says there's already been a plethora of student accommodation around colchester um the, the whole thing is out of context um you've got 10 stories high which happens to be one less than the cladding issue at 11 stories doesn't it um there's one bin store for 270 students and it's it's only in one building um, that means that they've all got to bring it down and 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 then there's one lay-by uh, which has got room for th three vehicles um, to, to for the refuse to be collected for buses to stop in because the highways have insisted on a bus stop um, and and of course there'll be other uh, deliveries and everything else whether it's Amazon or whoever um, there's only two disabled uh, units for students and no parking for them at all. I mean, the Civic Society has made a very good representation on the scheme, and uh, we, we're told that it's acceptable. But actually, if you look at the properties on the other side, not only the Spinnaker, but the properties on the other side are two, three, and four storey. I mean, these are going to be overshadowed by 10 storey buildings. They're not going to get any daylight. And what happened to our 45 degree shading and, sh and over, over, out, overlooking? Um, that doesn't seem to be um, considered. Um, the, the, the footpath along uh, going down to just six foot wide, uh, one foot eight, 1 1.8 meters, um, is, is less than half of the county council recommended height, uh, width for dual use of cycles and footpaths. You know why should we why should we compromise just to make this site economically developable we should stand firm and just say we we want higher standards in colchester um there's so much else to say really i mean the um the, the uh sorry bear with me i'm just getting to my notes <laughs> um but i i think uh the whole thing is just over development and and if you look at the other side of the river you've got you've got Sig hawkins road is re generally a quieter road um this one on this side of the river is a significant road across to across the tesco bridge to the uh, um, brinstead roundabout you've got traffic all day long and buses all day long and it's already uh, busy 
and you start putting another 270 um, students in there uh, with no parking, it's just not viable. Um, and the other thing that concerns me is um, there's a hundred uh, spaces for bicycles, and yet there's 270 students. Um, you know, the whole thing is out of out of proportion. So I'm I'm very concerned that it's overdevelopment by by a long way, and I'm sure in cultures we could we could have higher aspirations and be be more um, have something far more acceptable to the area. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much, Councillor Davidson. Um, I have a, another couple of speakers before I'll go back to you, Mr. Ryan. Um, Councillor Roger Mannion, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I share Councillor Davidson's comments. Uh, it, it does smack of overdevelopment. I mean, just on a simple level, there are 12 floors over two blocks. Okay. There are 20 to 21 student studios per floor sharing one kitchen. There is also one shared kitchen on the ground floor of each block or some shared kitchens on the ground floor. I have to say, in my experience in my student days, I didn't want to go down nine, ten floors to go and cook. If I did go down nine, ten floors, I'd be going outside somewhere. If I wanted to share a kitchen on each floor, I want some personal storage space, a fridge, which I can put my stuff in and I know that it's going to be safe. It doesn't seem to me that there is the space for this, certainly not for 21 studios. So I really do see concern that there's too many studios, not enough facilities, and as Councillor Davison says, overdevelopment. If this was to be approved, I would like to see less studios on each floor and more facilities for the students to be able to share. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor. Um, now, um, Councillor Chua. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I know you mentioned there that they want this place to be a no uh, car at all, no car parking. But my concern as well, I mean, I have my daughter been to university and all the rest of it, and some of us have as well, and been, you know, to university ourselves. When you move from one place to the next, to this studio, you know, uh, flat, you bring with you your baggage things, right? And they, are, they come in cars or your parents, whatever, bring it with you. And they got to have a parking space to take their things up to their rooms. So where are they parking? Or along the roads, block up the roads and all the rest of it. So. The idea of no parking is, you know, something not, you know, uh, that I would consider. Now, I also agree that it's overdevelopment. And um, I also agree with the council in-house uh, private sector team that pointed out that 26 studios are sharing one kitchen on the floor. Now, I have been, um, a uh, nursing you know, student myself and lived in accommodation. And that is at several, several many years ago, when we had to share one kitchen on the ground floor. And as mentioned, you walk all the way down from whatever floor you are to go down carrying your, your pots and things to cook. That is not something that you want to do. And in the end, we had eight rooms to one to each floor flats for kitchen. 26 studio flats to share one kitchen. And the way that the kitchen uh, cooker and the, um, and the sink, according to the report that I read through, they are next to each other and that is not safe. The other thing as well is, uh, it might be minor, but I am concerned for the students living in there. What is in that room, studio room? Is it just bed? and desk and lockers. Is there a basin in there? Now, don't tell me that you want to wake up in the morning, that you have to run to the queue up to the bathroom and all the rest to brush your teeth, you know, and comb your hair. So that uh, might be minor things, but they are things that concern me about the students living there. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Chair. Councillor Warns. Thank you, Chair. 
Um, a couple of clarifications from the officers, if I might. It, it talks about the desire to have the building secured by design and says this can be secured by a planning condition. But I had a look at the conditions at the end of the report and I can't see that in there. So I wondered if there could be some sort of reassurance, having said it was a good idea that it does actually appear as a planning condition. The other thing was to do with the NHS contribution, um, and it talks about the need to uh, to contribute over 71,000 for the provision of healthcare in the vicinity needed due to the increased demand that this scheme will generate. I used to work within that area um, on Hawkins Road between 2011 and 2015. I used to cross that road quite regularly, so I know it quite well. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, uh, one of the planning conditions when the Hyde Community Centre was built was that there would be a doctor's surgery built in that building. And indeed, there is space for a doctor's surgery, um, including a waiting room and parking space, but it was never used. Um, so I wondered whether that could be taken into consideration because it appears to me there is an, an unused medical facility that's been sitting there for some years. In terms of the planning balance, I, I, I think the report is right to say that it is, a, it, is, it is about weighting the significance of the, um, of the benefits against the significance of the harmful impact that the scheme has. And what I find it isn't helpful in this report is it, it actually says, it talks about the significance of the public benefit, and it talks about that being set against the impact of the scheme on the neighbouring dwellings. And we go into a lot of narrative about the light, about the sunlight, and various other aspects. But then it falls short and says that it doesn't think that the that the level of uh, of impact warrants a refusal but it doesn't talk about the significance of those impacts and that's that's the that's the material planning consideration if members want to turn it down then you've got to flag up what is the significance of the harmful impacts and i would have i would have liked to have seen a tabulated table that set out the benefits and and, and and the harm and helped us gauge some measure of what the significance of the two are because this report doesn't give it and so it's it's leaving up to us to to read the report in detail and work it all out in our minds and i think a little bit of help would have would have been beneficial to us so i end by saying it is a it, it is clearly a planning balance and if we're going to turn this down, then I'd be interested to know what the significance of the harm is. Because all I can see is what is mentioned in the report, the significance of the public benefit. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Warren. Um, I just had another indication, Mr. Ryan, so we'll take it. Councillor Harris. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I've listened to all that's been said so far, and, and I, I can see merit in every Every, every councillor has said so far. Um, uh, for me, um, I've got a question at the end, uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll preface it by the, uh, the policy TAO, TA2, the walking and cycling, and the fact that we saw some wonderful pictures up there uh, with the flats at, on a sort of riverside setting. And it seemed to me, unless the artist's impression is wrong, that you could ride a cycle straight off that prow, that public ride away, right into the water with no ratings. Um, if that's true, then we ought to be concerned about that and there ought to be some thought given to safety along that riverside front. Uh, people sort of riding on a prow and then ended up in the drink, as it were. Um, so that's my first point. Um, On to the points that have been made and, and, uh, and Councillor Warns and others have, have very eloquently spelt out the um, the, the risks of the scheme and that is there is a lot of residents here that I find absolutely sympathy with the Spinnaker pub 
and the other residents on that side of the, the river that have had an outlook for years and years um, and all of a sudden a very imposing very tall building that's already been uh, eloquently said by my colleagues on the other side of the room um, and the loss of privacy to those flats um, and the the impact that will have to those people's uh, way of life that they have now so i think it's overdevelopment to the, in the height ways and the number i would like to see it a lot uh, shorter than it is but what we're doing is looking at what was in before us come read that friends and not what's what i think it is um on balance uh, and i think councillor warns very very quietly said we've got to look at the impact and, and the um the the advantages of the of the thing and i find myself at the moment very much in that balance between uh, what's there and what the impact is here so i'm falling on the side of not supporting it personally um because of uh, the impact that's there it's a very very slim site very narrow very long and i dread to think what it would be like after 40 or 50 years time uh, after it's been built and and the the 20 year lease is up etc and what happens whether the student's still there chair or whether this is let out to other people after that becomes private rented at the quality at the moment you know on the face of it would look good but then it may go downhill in years to come um i, I really do feel that the history of this site has got to be thought through but i don't feel very enamored by the height and the impact to the Spinnaker pub and the residents on that seafront. Thank you, Chair. Thank, thank you, Councillor Harris. Well, there's an awful lot of questions there, Mr. Ryan, but I hope um, you'll be able to sort of gather them together and give us some answers. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> yeah, I'll, um, I'll go through them as I wrote them down and um, try and address them. Need, I think need was the first thing. Um, if you look at 16.37 in the report, there is a table demonstrating the projected um, student requirement or the projected students um, and student level of the student body. Um, that has come from um, the applicants from the university to the applicants to me um, within the last couple of weeks. That is the most up-to-date data. It shows how they predict um, that there'll be a significant increase in um, students and so there absolutely is the need this scheme would not be being um proposed if there wasn't the chance that it was going to be full the whole time obviously it's a huge investment um so there absolutely is the need as set out in the report um the height hold on let me share my screen with regards to the flats opposite On that drawing, you could, there is a, uh, so that's a drawing I showed, pre oh, that's a drawing I showed previously. Um, the, can you just see my cursor there? It's not showing correctly on where it's almost. So those are the flats opposite. So they are significantly lower. But my, the thing that uh, members must be mindful of is that the building is tall in one section. And then, as you can see on this elevation, it steps, steps down significantly. And these are also the flats there, you can see. So with the gap and the Spinnaker pub there, directly opposite, and then generally lower at this end. So it's felt that uh, you know, a gateway building such as this is um, intentionally designed to be large to um, bring the capacity onto site. You know, the applicants, there's no bones about that. The applicants need, need a certain amount of dwellings on site to be able to deliver the um, scheme. But um, in design terms, officers consider that to be acceptable. Um, cycling was mentioned. Um, there have been discussions directly between the applicants and the culture to cycling campaign. Um, as I noted previously, they, the um, idea is to bring people cycling over the other side of the river across the bridge and then over the new crossing that's proposed. Highways are requesting that the 
public right of way is not used for cycling. Hence why the cycle parking is being moved to the south of the site, so you don't need to, so students don't need to cycle along it. Um, it's not wide enough to be a shared cycleway footway. They simply can't fit that on site. Um, it just takes up too much width. It's still 1.8 meters at its, at its narrowest and significantly wider throughout most of the, uh, the site. So that is held to be acceptable. Show you. So you'll be able to still be able to get straight along if it's not. The idea is that there'll be students milling around and, and the applicants weren't particularly keen either on having people whizzing up and down there on their bikes. So you would need to wheel your bike along if you wanted to use that um, section. But the, the you know, public rights away are designated for pedestrians. So that is that the idea is to preserve it for pedestrians and for cyclists to use this bridge here and be able to cycle through this section. Um, hold on. I, mean, I think um, Councillor Davison mentioned the, the com why compromise. I think, as, as, as to discuss in terms of planning balance, it is a compromise. Um, why compromise is because this will deliver the significant public benefits in terms of the housing supply, the river wall works, the public footpath um, reinstatement that will not be delivered without a scheme of this nature. It's as simple as that. So that, that is why there does need to be, or officers consider there should be a compromise. Obviously members can make up their, make their own call, but that's why it's being recommended uh, for approval. Um, in terms of the general overdevelopment, um, arguments. It's considered that this level of development is what is needed. The applicants have come down by 30 bedrooms slash studios uh, within the application period. So this is this is the, the limit of the scheme they are willing to uh, provide on site to deliver those um, benefits. Being mindful of the engineering that needs to take place to make the sky the scheme um, a goer in the first place. Um, the kitchens, the kitchen and studio issue is mentioned. They are fully appointed studios, so they have every, they have a kitchen, they have a small kitchenette, a fridge, shower, toilet in the room. So everyone has their own studio, and then the cluster flat is more for social gatherings or having a pizza together, um, uh, or for cooking for friends, for example. So you don't you, you can stay in your room if you want to, similar to what they've got at Avon Way. It's a bespoke student product. It is designed for students and it is extremely popular, hence why they are putting 20 to 25 million pounds into the site to bring this scheme forward because they have the popularity behind them to, to fill these units. Um, there was a point made about what if it becomes normal private housing. It will be conditioned so it won't. It is only acceptable and is only being recommended to you on the basis of being bespoke student accommodation and no other form of private rental accommodation. Um, the, that will be secured in the legal agreement and is, is secured by condition. Um, the Councillor Chua mentioned parking space, the drop off, that has been um, something that's been looked into in some significant detail. Um, as was already said, the applicants run another student accommodation scheme down the road and they are very aware of the fact that um, you don't want everyone turning up and dropping their bags off at the same time. So those, that's why there are some spaces on site, and that is to allow allocated and managed drop off and um, pick up for people to, at, 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 at times of which there is enough spaces to um, allow that to happen. So that will avoid indiscriminate parking in the uh, immediate area. So that has been significantly thought about. That's why there's some parking spaces, if not, any more than our sustainability team would like to see. Um, secured by design, yes, the police mentioned that. It, is, it wasn't a suggested condition. I know the applicants would accept that as a condition um, if that is something that members would like to see. So we're happy to amend the resolution to include a condition to require secured by design. That's not a problem. 
um, the NHS and their contribution. It's it's kind of up to them what they deal with that what they do with that money. It's an interesting point that Councillor Warren's made in terms of the surgery at the Colm Community Centre. It's certainly not there currently. Um, that is for their estates team to, to decide how they um, want to bring provision that will facilitate the uh, people that use this facility. Um, but it is something that can be, it would need to be investigated by the NHS, but it's uh, it, it is an interesting point. Not something that we could secure through this scheme, unfortunately. Um, inter very interesting point about the planning balance. Um, that is the crux of the argument, absolutely. I mean, wh why we don't provide a kind of tabulated um, planning balance system in the uh, committee report is because it's it, it's not something that planners we want to quantify because it's not necessarily quantifiable. It, it's, a, it's a planning balance in terms of you could, you could view it as a seesaw effectively, but it really is up to members ultimately to, uh, to decide what weight they afford to the public benefit as set out in the report. Um, it, there's, there's not a kind of numerical system that can be awarded. Um, as you'll see, officers obviously made the call that on balance, the, they consider after careful assessment on balance, the benefits outweigh any perceived harm. Um, but it's not something that we would normally and to my knowledge have ever tabulated in terms of a these are the things that are good these are the things that are, on, are held to be adverse and therefore it tips in one way or the other um it is a holistic approach that is taken to the planning balance and you know all the various elements of the balance are set out in the committee report so that is one for members to have a think about but officers are absolutely clear um benefits in terms of housing, land supply, and student accommodation, and the um, seawall, as noted, are considered to outweigh the adverse impacts. Uh, Councillor Harris raised an, import, an interesting point about the, um, but it kind of feeds into the cycleway question. Um, balustrading is not currently intended because it is intended to be, if, if you know, there is tends to be balustrading down the other side of the river, but not on this side because this is where the boats moor. So um, it's difficult to have balustrading where boats are mooring. This will have a series of bollards to allow boats to moor as they currently do and, uh, and future boats to moor. So the, hence why it is not perceived to be a cycle route, but a um, pedestrian route where 1.8 meters is sufficient to be able to walk down there without uh, toppling in, basically. I think that addresses the issues, but let me know if I've missed anything. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor McLean. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for the um, enlightenment of the uh, of how where we're going. Um, so all I've heard from your response is we're going on balance, not enough money to make it pay, we're compromising, we're ignoring the private housing that's opposite for the height of these properties. How many acres of open space will these students have to play on or to exercise on or to enjoy? It doesn't look like very much. We've got um, cycleways that aren't up to standard, but there are pavements but you can share these or we don't encourage it, but they will use them no matter what. They cannot be policed. So I've heard so much negativity that we are trying to pinch this into something because of the housing supply or what it's going to provide. I think we need to do better than this. I think we can do better than this if for Colchester. We don't need to make it fit. We need to make it somewhere that students are going to be very happy, enjoy, be very safe, and have the amenities that actually go with being in a university town. So I, I cannot support this tonight with what I've been hearing. I don't think it's fair. I don't think it's on balance. And I don't think we should compromise. So. That's my thought. Thank you, Councillor McLean. Councillor Oxford. Thank you, Chair. Um, 
A question that Councillor Davidson asked hasn't been addressed, but you did have a lot to try and remember. And that is that uh, he's saying that there's only one refuge shed for the, all the blocks. Now, I know in my ward, I've got flats, a similar number of uh, accommodation, where they've got five refuge sheds with recycling and so on. If there's only one, then obviously it's going to encourage the wrong sort of behaviour on that. Uh, and the other one is, I think just from what Councillor McLean's just said, it clearly indicates why this site has been empty and a dump for the last 50 years. Oh, thank Is that all, Councillor Oxford? Yes, <laughs> yes thank you. <laughs> thank you, Councillor Oxford. Um, Mr. Ryan, would you like to comment again? Yeah, the, uh, as far as I'm aware, there is a refuse, there's refuse um, areas for both blocks. I can go through the plans. Um, uh, we, we couldn't, I don't think that's, a, that's a, a, an issue that the scheme needs to fall over on. We can certainly ensure that it certainly is. I'll just pour, pour through the plans if you'd like me to. Thank you very much. Um, we are, it looks to be, I'm not happy at all with this application. So, um, Mr. Cairns, are you able to offer us any further information that perhaps we can use? We're considering overdevelopment, particularly. Um, can you, and also, of course, the height of the buildings with the 10 stories. Can you enlighten, if you can? Uh, thank you, Chair. Yes, um, in terms of overdevelopment, um, really that would mean that the scheme in some way was in breach of your own adopted policies for uh, housing standards. Now, as Mr. Ryan has explained, this is not a housing scheme, but a student accommodation block. So it's not intended that, these, uh, that the occupiers will permanently reside um, at these uh, units, that they will simply use them much in the same way as a hotel um, as temporary accommodation during term time. Um, in terms of the use of outdoor space, uh, the students have access to the whole of the campus within very close walking distance. And there are limited but very pleasant open outdoor areas that would be created um, within the curtilage of the building. I think um, James has uh, explained there is a, a tidal terrace area which would allow um, uh, the, the, the creation of quite a, a significant amount of green space within the site that doesn't presently exist. Um, we have obviously dealt with a number of student accommodation blocks, both within and without the university campus. In terms of uh, off-campus blocks, we have many blocks in the immediate vicinity which have quite limited outdoor space. Um, in our experience, students do not use outdoor space extensively. Um, they tend to use their rooms and then go off and, uh, and, and socialize or, or recreate elsewhere. Um, so in terms of the concept of overdevelopment, I think it'd be very difficult to say in terms of the occupiers, and I know Councillor McLean raised this issue in terms of safe and happy students, that um, there were, they were being provided with an inadequacy of amenities. Uh, on site. Um, we have a number of blocks I've explained, both, both at the Hythe um, and, and elsewhere on Magdalen Street, for example, where there is limited but, but some outdoor space, um, not unlike this particular proposal, and it does seem to work. Um, I think we must be careful not to conflate normal housing with student accommodation, because it is quite a different product. It's also different in planning terms. It's not a C3 use, a residential use, it's a sui generis use. So it is in a class of its own and therefore needs to be um, considered in that way. Um, in terms of the planning balance, as Mr. Ryan explained, the weighting that you, impo that you uh, apply as the decision maker uh, has to be your own. We are not here to dictate, we are only here to advise you. It's our advice that we, we have an identified very considerable public benefits that, in our opinion, do outweigh the negative aspects of the scheme. Um, that is not to say that we do not acknowledge there are negative aspects. All planning decisions 
involves some degree of harm. That is the nature of development. Um, that is the, the reality of the difficult decisions that planning involves. Um, the planning balance is a method that uh, enables you to, to, uh, uh, to, to effectively um, seek to weigh up whether those positive aspects of the scheme outweigh the negative ones. Um, the report does detail in a very honest way the loss of light which some residents will suffer. Um, it doesn't gloss over that, it doesn't attempt to deny that in any way. But what it does say is that within a dense urban environment, that is almost inevitably going to happen if a building of any scale went on this site. Um, it is a brownfield site, it's within the developable area of Colchester, and it is within a regeneration area. Um, I am aware that members have sought to channel student accommodation from the town centre to the university campus in the general area of the university. This is within very, very close walking distance. There is a proven need in terms of the planned growth of the university for this form of accommodation. And it must be recalled that students occupying this form of accommodation do not occupy residential homes spread throughout the town leading to the problems which I'm sure you as ward councillors have experienced through unmanaged students occupying normal family dwelling houses in residential areas. Um, in terms of the car parking, we have many blocks which are car free, not least the, uh, the, the student block which was built on Magdalen Street, which is also car free. I'm not aware that's created any problems of overspill from parking. Um, in that particular instance, we made it a requirement of the legal agreement that students were discouraged and indeed as part of their lease were prevented from being, bringing a car to the accommodation. And if members felt that would um, add additional comfort, particularly for local residents fearing overspill, that could be added to the terms of the legal agreement. Um, in terms of the heights, on the west bank of the Colne, you'll be aware of the Maltings development, which is very significant in height. It's a very bulky building on a corner site, and I think does rise to at least within a story of this development, and Mr. Ryan can, can confirm that. But as, as far as I'm concerned, it is very comparable in scale and mass um, to this proposal. Um, this particular proposal is very tall, but it is quite slender and elegant. Um, it isn't a bulky building, it's not a deep plan building. Um, so it does in some ways reflect traditional uh, warehouse buildings, some of which do survive uh, at the uh, northern end of the Hythe. You know, the Mapanite warehouses, for example, uh, embrace a very similar architectural idiom. So it's not completely alien, as has been suggested. In many ways, it would reinforce that riverside uh, warehouse character that um, previously existed, albeit not on this particular site. This site was used for industrial purposes, for lime kilns and for coal storage. It was never um, occupied by um, fine or interesting buildings. So I think the, the decision before you, Chair, is to weigh up um, the, uh, the planning benefits of the scheme, which have been outlined in terms of providing uh, student accommodation, in a highly sustainable location, very easy walking distance to the campus, uh, which would clean up a deeply brown site with major problems uh, in terms of the uh, river wall, which is collapsing. The, uh, the, it would finally reinstate a riverside walk, which would be a huge public benefit for not only the students, but for residents of the area and would link through to the pedestrian footbridge. So there are an awful lot of positive things that would flow, but there are also negatives. And uh, as officers, we've sought to be extremely transparent and honest about those, and they are set out within the report in some detail. Um, but those negative aspects, uh, in the opinion of your officers, are outweighed by the positive benefits of the scheme. And that really is the, 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 uh, the centre of the decision that you have to reach this evening. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Cairns. Uh, Councillor Oxford. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> um, Councillor Barton was asking about need earlier. In 16.37, it 
it states that another 1,694 student flats will be required by 2028. Um, so that's quite a lot more re still required. And I didn't mention it earlier, but I do know because it comes from my ward, the 61 bus operates every 10 minutes for most of the day, and it goes straight through to Wivano, including the university. So obviously that makes good links for people who don't necessarily have to cycle or walk. Um, and there are also buses from the Avon Way side of Grinstead that go into town and back again. So again, there's quite a good bus links there on the site, just to give a balance for people to consider before they vote. Um, so um, obviously the height of the buildings is still an issue, but most of the other points raised have been responded to and ruled out like for instance about their own have their own facilities in each flat etc and uh, refuge sheds being in both blocks etc and obviously parking you can book parking to to load unload etc so there are a number of things there that were raised that have now been addressed but um it's down to balance again Thank you, Councillor Oxford. Councillor Davidson. Yes, I'd, I'd like to thank the officers for their uh, considerations, and um, uh, I totally agree. It, it's balance and acceptability. Um, and I really have still got significant issues um, in that, um, yes, the bin, the bin stores can be supplied for each building, that's fine. Um, each one's only got about 100 students to, um, to serve it. Serve it. Um, but the biggest thing for me is the impact and the, on the street scene, the air quality that's going to be along that road, because it's a very busy road. It's not like Avon Way or Hawkins Road, where there actually there, there's really very little through traffic. But you've got a, you know, got a major highway um, and you've got 10 storey buildings beside it. And I'm sorry, and seven or eight storey buildings. Um, so I... I think the world's moved on. I mean, you, I mentioned Amazon earlier, but I mean, you know, with whoever's delivering or whether it's food deliveries or anything else, there, there just aren't the facilities to service that number of students. I mean, I'm in favour of student accommodation, but only where there's a significant or a, an appropriate site. And I just feel that this is not an appropriate site and there is overdevelopment for the area, in, area available. Um, so, yeah, that's my thoughts, Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Councillor Davidson. Um, I think a lot of us are thinking of overdevelopment, um, but on what grounds do we have any grounds, um, Mr. Cairns, for if we were to refuse this on those grounds? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, in terms of overdevelopment, I think, as I explained, I think you would have to demonstrate uh, either that the proposal was in breach of our own uh, policies with regard to um, development. Um, there are no specific student accommodation policies. Um, and I think, as the report explains, there are provision, there is provision for drop off and servicing of the blocks in response to Councillor Davidson's concerns. Um, the blocks do provide for high quality self-contained accommodation in the main with shared uh, communal facilities for uh, social interaction. Um, in terms of sunlight and daylight, um, in terms of the impact on the neighboring properties, that is set out in the report, but if members felt they wanted to have further information on that particular uh, aspect we could look further into that and provide you with greater comfort around that particular issue in terms of the street scene um, i think there have been some cgis cgis which have been shared with you that do demonstrate that in terms of the the various views of the buildings in in terms of long and short views um, the materiality of the building and its architecture and its detailing um, is fundamentally of a high architectural quality um, this isn't a shoddy or a cheap building. Um, it will age elegantly, potentially, um, in the longer term. 
So in terms of the street scene, uh, I think that matter has probably been closed off, um, that the buildings uh, are considered to, to, be, um, to be responsive to their environment, albeit taller than what is there now. But uh, in terms of what has happened on the opposite bank of the river, um, this is not out of keeping and would largely continue the trend of the scale of development in, in latter years. Um, air quality, I think that matter has been covered off in the report. Um, there are no um, concerns from environmental protection around canyonization or air quality. Um, so again, I'm afraid we couldn't give you any um, grounds for refusing on the grounds of canyonization. And in terms of deliveries, uh, I believe the scheme does make adequate provision and we do not have an objection from county highways but I'll hand you over to James on those particular issues. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr Chair. Just, just to, uh, I want to be absolutely clear about the <clears throat> refuse. It, um, Councillor Manning was absolutely correct. It is in one block. However, they are studio accommodation units, so they have their own bins. And the idea is you go down to the block. Um, it's got a huge bin store on the ground floor. It's 82 square meters, which is a significant room for the storage of, uh, of bins. If that's something that members are prim absolutely concerned about, I'm sure we could condition that that is split amongst the two blocks. If members were looking to approve, I can't imagine that would cause an issue. Uh, but the idea is that you keep your refuse in your room until you go walk past it next time and then dump it in the large bins downstairs, exactly what they do at Avon Way, and they don't have any problems there. I think a lot of those problems are just, what a perception of those problems, are less likely to arrive when you have a managed block like this with effectively a concierge and people on site throughout the day helping the students deal with their various day-to-day -day matters. Um, there is a specific Amazon slash other internet uh, delivery storage room. So there's, there's a drop-off bay for those kind of things. They're absolutely alive to the fact that students get loads of deliveries. Um, I know that on the maltings, there's a Amazon box where you can uh, get things delivered to, and they've, they've got a room for one of those in this um, in this uh, building, and a, a pull in for the Amazon vans to come and pull into. So it's not it's car free, but it's got servicing, so you won't have to pull up in the road. Thank you. Thank you, um, Mr. Ryan. Uh, Councillor Warns, please. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, um, it is finely balanced and. It does appear that most of the considerations have have been thought about and there are mitigations. Um, looking at page 135 of our agenda where it talks about the material planning considerations, it lists nine common material planning considerations. Um, and it strikes me that, that there's one heading that it, it, perhaps Mr. Cairns can offer some comment on to help those that are struggling with the uh, with the concept of overdevelopment. It talks about the consideration of scale, bulk, mass, and visual appearance. I wondered whether you could give us some comment as to the reasonableness and the sustainability of refusing this planning permission on those grounds. Thank you, Councillor Warns. Mr. Cairns? Um, design, as we know, it is always a subjective matter, regardless of how we like to dress it up. It is, um, you know, as ever, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. In terms of the scale, scale is a, is a uh, bulk and mass, and the appropriateness of scale, bulk and mass is, is obviously contextual. Um, in this instance, we have many large scale buildings um, that increasingly line the banks of the of the uh, of this part of the coal um, the maltings on the west bank is very close at hand is a large bulky blocky building um, and arguably this scheme would be significantly more elegant than it and indeed the buildings on the opposite side of the building um, have a very significant scale bulk and mass um, in terms of bulkiness i would say this building is quite slender in its form, you know, partly as a result, undeniably, of the, uh, of the form of the site. But uh, that does result in almost a fin-like quality to the building. It is quite relatively shallow plan. 
uh, and it does step down and cascade in massing to the north of the site. So in long views from, uh, from the uh, conservation area to the north, one would see the, the, the mass of the building stepping up um, away from the, view, from the viewer. Um, in terms of views from the bridge over the Colne and the roundabout, the building would be seen in the immediate context of buildings of significant scale, um, because you would no longer see it contextually in the smaller scaled residential development to the west, which is you know two, three, and four stories. Um, the view of the Spinnaker pub as a non-designated heritage asset um, has been retained by the break in the built form, uh, a bit like the Queen's House at Greenwich. Um, you know, it is framed would be framed by significantly scaled blocks, um, but that is uh, uh, considered um, in our mind to uh, to retain the functional link between the Spinnaker pub and the river, to recall that really important fu functional link. Um, the dwellings to the west would admittedly lose any potential uh, longer views from those dwellings back to the river. Um, but the loss of a view is not a planning matter. Um, it's for you as members to consider whether the loss of outlook would be such to warrant refusal. Um, I would say there is potential for a loss of, uh, uh, of outlook and daylight, but there are very considerable public benefits to this scheme in terms of bringing a very brown site back into beneficial use. Um, we've heard it's been vacant for 50 years. Um, there is no, uh, no obvious solution that would remediate uh, a contaminated site like this or provide for the reconstruction of the river wall and the reinstatement of a public walk. Um, all of those are very considerable public benefits and they're linked through to the pedestrian bridge over the Colne. Um, I note that members have stated it is finely balanced. Um, I think if it is finely balanced, uh, there are very positive matters that you need to have regard to in your consideration and drawing your conclusions. Um, I think as some members have pointed out an awful lot of the uh, apparent um, objections to the scheme have fallen away in the course of this, this discussion this evening, Chair, and you are left with some quite limited uh, number of objections in terms of sunlight, daylight, uh, and uh, impact on residential amenity um, set against the list of public benefits which have been presented this evening. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Cairns. Um, members, would it be helpful, therefore, if we ask for a deferral? For oh, sorry, I beg your pardon. Uh, Councillor Mannion. Oh, sorry. Oh, Councillor Oxford. <laughs> I can't see that. Thank you. Away. Can I just ask Mr. Cairns um, if he could um, inform us whether what how likely it would be that we could defend an appeal should one happen based on the comments made in 16.69 and 16.70, please, because it might help our deliberations. Uh, thank you, Councillor Oxford Chair. Um, in terms of 16.69 and 16.7, those paragraphs refer to the essentially different nature of the uh, occupation of these buildings as opposed to a normal C3, C3 residential use, um, so a normal dwelling house. Um, these are not normal dwelling houses. They are not intended to be permanently occupied, and it is proposed to be conditioned um, as such to prevent their permanent occupation. So that fear, I think, can be set aside from your minds, members, in the planning balance because uh, the residents of these buildings will never be normal uh, residents. They are there as students to study 
and then to return to their dwelling places. It's a bit like a hotel or a second home for people working away from home. Um, in terms of the, uh, the levels of space that these uh, units of accommodation offer, they are not the uh, sorts of um, spaces that we would expect to provide for permanent occupancy. And I think a number of members have raised concerns should these ever be um, sought for uh, residential permanent occupation. Um, however, there would be a condition imposed and they are not within the same class of the use classes order. And uh, we can um, ensure that uh, no such uh, unauthorized change of use were, could ever occur on those buildings. Um, if that is a major concern to members. Um, over to uh, Mr. Ryan. Yeah, but just to add to that, as I, I did say, it's a, this is a completely bespoke solution based on the um, operator's experience of what students want. Um, the, much of the ground floor is study space areas, meeting room areas, social space areas. They've got a gym and, a, and like an in-house movie theater. So these are, I mean, when I put those, to be perfectly honest, when I put those um, private sector housing comments to uh, beyond the box, they, they came back to me and said, well, our, I mean, it's just generally accepted that our student accommodation is, is fantastic and we've got long waiting lists because people want to live in it. So it's, um, it is a bespoke offer. So refusing it on the basis that they don't comply with the standards that we would require for normal residential um, accommodation would, would be, it, I just simply, it would not be a sustainable appeal and would be risky, I would have thought, in, in terms of costs, because it is a different project and it is sold as a completely different product. Um, and uh, yeah, a, a well, one with great facilities. Thank you, Mr. Ryan. Councillor McLean. Thank you for that explanation. I'm still having a job to come to terms with the massing of the student accommodation. So they're not going to be there forever, so that's fine. But the residents that own the other side of the road, a loss of light and have to, the outlook, I know they're not entitled to a view, but the loss of, the loss of light will have a massive effect. They will have to live with that forevermore if they stay there forevermore. It just, does, it just doesn't seem to sit right that it's fine because the students are only there part time and they'll be going home. But the residents that actually live in the area will have to look out onto this mass and have their light restricted. I find that very hard to come to terms with. Um, members, would it help if we asked for a deferral in order for Mr. Ryan to take this away to do, as Mr. Cairns said, could be done to actually look at this impact of light deprivation just for us to see how bad it is or how not so bad it is that would give us more time to really look into that. How do members feel about that? Councillor Warns. Um, I hear what, you, what you're asking, Chair. Um, there, is, there are paragraphs devoted in the report that goes into some detail about the actual loss of light. I wondered whether Mr. Ryan could enlarge upon that for our benefit so we have a proper understanding of, of what that balance is. Mr. Ryan? Uh, thank you, yes. Um, it's set out in paragraph 16.8 all the way through to 16.94 in terms of um, daylight. There's a paragraph on specifically on sunlight and there's a, a paragraph on um, overlooking. I mean, I, I'm not sure a deferral will be able to provide you with any more detail than that. Um, the, to surmise, the, this is something that's been taken very seriously by officers and we've received something that we don't often receive, which is a thoroughly detailed um, daylight and sunlight assessment by an independent consultant. An independent consultant is employed by the applicants, I must add, not, not by us. Um, but my report there takes you through, has tried to summarise a very lengthy report where they looked at the impact, I say sorry, on every single window. Um, 
think the key points are that in terms of the BRE guidance, which they um, they use to assess these things, um, there's no actual pass and fail. Um, it just it assesses the potential impact to the various windows um, and the the impact upon them. Um, I think what I set out there is that there are there will be an impact. It's as simple as that. Um, their professional consultant considered that, particularly in line with other appeals that they dealt with and appeals that they cited, the um, impact will not be sufficient to the point where it is noticeable in those rooms. And that was their professional opinion. So if this was refused and we went to a public inquiry, that would be the, the technical expert that would be making those um, comments that it is within within their professional judgment the scheme is acceptable in those grounds so i don't think if we were to defer more information would be provided beyond what they already have provided which is absolutely significant it's an, it's, a, a, it's an acceptance that there is an impact on those windows but the acceptance what the um, what the suggestion is is that it needs to be accepted to facilitate the development of this site and it's not necessarily just the large block because if you look at where the large block sits it sits quite a long way down to the bottom of the south near the entrance to the national grid power site and an existing the uh, colchester council owned industrial site that's where the main block sits effectively so it's not a case of chopping a floor of it making much difference the development of this of this site will have an impact on daylight because the, the uh, neighbours have enjoyed outlook directly over an empty site for years. So there's no shying away from that fact, but I don't think a deferral would be able to provide you with any further information, to be perfectly honest. Thank you, Mr. Ryan. Uh, Councillor Chua. Thank you, Chairman. I hear what has been said about the students do not occupy the buildings permanently, they are there and then they turn and they go and you know, they come back at a certain time. But the point is, the buildings that's been built, the building is still there, is standing. And that's, you know, regarding the sunlight and the daylight, it will be there. That's the point I want to, well, it's, it's in my mind, it sits in my mind that the building is still there, whether the students are there or not. Thank you. Councillor Harris. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, we seem to be going around in circles, don't we? Mm -hmm. um, asking the same question around and around and around. And for me, the balance, um, as you eloquently described earlier on, is very fine. Um, it's whether you think that the, uh, the impact we're going to make to the existing residents, has been said, uh, is enough uh, benefit that you're going to get to compensate for that. And I don't think it is, so I'm not I'm not of a mind to do this. I've also got a point to make, Chair, that I want to make about the River Wall. That is a significant investment to do piling. Uh, I'm, I'm an ex-railway engineer for many years. I'm not a river engineer, but a railway engineer. So I know a bit about the costs of, of engineering. That's not cheap. However, don't let that factor you for me, because you cannot build this building without that piling being put in place. It's a very narrow site. You have to protect slip with that height for building. And I'm convinced that that, that would have to be done if you build on that site in any case. Um, so for me, that's part of the course. But for, for me, having gone around circles and listened to what everybody said and listened to the flavour of, of the meeting, I'm not going to support it. I'm sorry, I'm just not. Are you prepared to put in a proposal, therefore, Councillor Harris? I will. What is your proposal to refuse? On the, um, on the impact to the residents and the loss of light and overshadowing and the stature of the building. Thank you. Do we have a seconder for that? Councillor McLean. Mr Carmichael. Thank you, Chair. Um, in this circumstance, I would refer members to, would you like to institute the drop procedure as noted in the back of the everyone's agenda? Um, we've never really been in favour of the drop <laughs> in this committee. 
So I would say probably not. Thank you. So members, we have a proposal on the table to refuse this application um, with all those implications for appeal and everything else. So um, we will go to the vote. Sorry, are you vote? Sorry, all those in favour? No, I just... Sorry, Count... Okay, okay. Councillor Warns, did you want to say something? I just think, given the gravity of what Councillor Harris has proposed and that we have discussed those very points, um, I think a final word from Mr Cairns in terms of the sustainability of such a move, I think would be appropriate at, at this stage. Mr Cairns? Uh, thank you, Chair. Yes, um, in terms of the impact on residents, the loss of light, and the scale of the buildings. Um, we have obviously, and Mr Ryan has just reviewed the evidence within the report, um, which concludes that the impact will be not noticeable in the majority of cases for residents. Um, you are refusing it on quite limited grounds and you do have quite limited evidence to support the view that the loss of light in itself um, outweighs the planning balance, um, given that the very significant public benefits that have been identified. Um, the stature of the buildings, again, you need to have regard to the other buildings in the vicinity, including the Maltings and the uh, other student blocks on the opposed bank of the river. Um, I would ask you to think very carefully, is this so out of character that it would result in townscape harm? Um, having regard to the MPPF um, and the design policies set out therein. Um, if members were so uh, opined, we could provide further um, information regarding these particular aspects of the scheme and your likelihood of success on appeal. That isn't to say that if the drop procedure had been invoked that uh, we would um, have done anything other than to have supported you and given you further evidence around those particular aspects and the likelihood and risk of success on appeal. Um, but possibly it is now too late to go back on that chair. Um, but I would, I would say that uh, you do need to, um, you do need to tread very carefully, having regard to the evidence you have before you and whether you have adequacy of evidence to support the view that an, an, an unacceptable loss of light would flow from this scheme. As Mr Ryan has explained, the southern part of the site does not actually address the residents. Um, it is more the, the midpoint of the site and the, the, the uh, area to the north which addresses the uh, more residential areas um, opposite to the west. Um, so. Really to conclude, Chair, if you can tread very carefully, think um, whether you have adequate evidence to support a refusal based on loss of light um, and the scale of the buildings, having regard to your knowledge of the vicinity and the scale of buildings that were set out, I think by Mr. Ryan um, in the, uh, um, the, there is a specific drawing. I don't, James, can you put that up please? Yes, sure shows the scale of the buildings. I think um, it may aid members in their consideration um, of the particular issue of the scale of buildings in the vicinity. I don't know whether it is too late, members, to consider the drop. We've never wanted to um, consider that before, but, be but Councillor Davidson. Uh, yes, just, just a briefly, uh, Chairman. Um, Mr Cairns, what, what are the opportunities for, um, if we go for a deferral of reducing the height of these buildings so that the impact is less um, because I do appreciate uh, Councillor Harris's point that the, the wall of the river needs rebuilding it's a marginal site and that's the whole point it's really you know it's it's overdevelopment of that site because the, the, the finances dictate that but we're compromising on quality of accommodation we're com uh, compromising on uh, all sorts of other things just to achieve that and um, I just wonder if the uh, applicant could potentially reduce the height by um, say, say down to seven or eight stories rather than ten. 
Thank you, Chair. If members were um, so, you know, so moved, we would be um, obviously happy to take it back to the applicants and uh, see what could be done with regard to potential changes in story heights and further evidence around potential impacts for the um, dwellings in consequence. Thank you, Mr. Cairns. Um, Mr. Carmichael, can, we, we do have a proposal on the table um, and we've now seemed to have this other opportunity to come before us. So do we have another proposal that we actually go for that drop for the deferral? Well, can I, prefer, uh, can I propose that we defer uh, to the officers to renegotiate the height, in, in specifically the height and the access to this, this site? We have a second of that, Councillor Mannion. Yes? Under the circumstances, I'll withdraw my proposal. Thank you, Chair. Oh, thank you very much, Councillor Harris. That's extremely helpful. Um, I think finally, we have got to where members are more comfortable because we have so many you know, concerns over this development. So we have this um, proposal to defer for officers to uh, take back and discuss the height of these, these buildings with the developers. So, all those in favour? I believe that's unanimous, Chair. Thank you very much, Mr. Carmichael, and uh, thank you everybody for your patience, and uh, no doubt we will be discussing this application again in the future. Councillor McLean. I'd just like to say, I think it's so important we actually do do the site visits. We're all sitting here looking at a picture which doesn't show us very much, but when you're actually standing there, you can see more. We should be more proactive in what we're doing. Um, I think we, we owe that to the residents of Colchester to actually de deliberate over something. Well, several of us have visited the site and several of us do know the site very well. So although we didn't have a communal a common visit, which I think is uh, the count, um, officers are looking into to facilitate that going forward post COVID. Um, several of us do know the site and have visited it, and um, it is an extremely problematical site, and that's why we've had such a long consultation this evening. So Agreed, think... Chair. I went there today and uh, I valued that walkthrough. It's very, very important to do that. I agree. Thank you. Thank you, um, members. Um, all that's left for us to do now. <laughs> all that's left for us to do now is to um, approve the minutes. So we have uh, on the right piece of paper. We have the minutes of our previous meeting. Um, does anybody have any comments to make on those minutes? No? Um, then uh, can we go for approval, members? Do you approve the minutes of our last meeting? Those are approved, Chair. Thank you very much. Well, that concludes our meeting for this evening. So thank you, members, and thank you, everyone who is, uh, had been here and watching on YouTube. Thank you very much, and wish you a very pleasant evening.